Hello and welcome. I know it's been a little while since I've done a video, but I was so excited about this project that I keep making samples and more ideas and it, they take a little while. So I thought, boy, if I don't get this done, you're not gonna be able to start your projects and I can be doing this forever. I could, I could do another video a week from now on this subject. So it's become my new obsession. I love it. I hope you enjoy it. Um, if you do, give me a thumbs up. If you're brand new to my channel, um, hit subscribe so you don't miss out on anything. And if you have been following along, thank you for sticking by me because I know it's been a couple weeks since I've posted anything. So today I wanted to add a video to the new series I started. And uh, if you follow my Facebook page, you know that I do a lot of different things and I know that I'm not the only one. Um, but I have been making jewelry for many years and I sell it on my website. Um, and then I also, in the last year, have become obsessed with mixed media and junk journaling and um, paper craft and all that kind of stuff. And then in the evenings, I knit and I have an Etsy shop that I uh, sell my neck warmers that I knit. So in this series, I wanted to kind of combine all the things that I do so that I don't feel like I'm missing working on one subject matter that I like, that I can kind of try to combine them all together and, and do fun projects. So for this one, I want to share with you how you can take um, just your discard boxes, leftover paper scraps, whatever, junk, and turn them into your own custom handmade buttons. So if you do Knitting like I do, you know, it's not always easy to find beautiful buttons in a size that you want to use for neck warmers. So that kind of had me decide where I wanted to start with this. But then if you do um, journaling and make altered books and that kind of stuff, you know that you use these for closures or just decorative things or decorative paper clips, all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to kind of show you some ideas that I came up with different ways to use the buttons once you know how to make them. And it kind of took my love of the whole mixed media paper craft thing with recycling, which I love, and combining it with my jewelry making by using this jeweler's grade resin, the ice resin. So if you did not watch the very first video in this series, I would, and you haven't worked with ice resin, I would encourage you to go back and watch that one because it's just not a very long one, but it, it goes through how to mix and what it does and uh, teaches you how to make a resin paper, that kind of thing. But I'm going to be using that product in a lot of these things. So um, it, it might be helpful to go back if you haven't, if you haven't ever worked with it before. So I'm going to show you first some of the ones that I have finished. I have lots in different um, stages of completion because, like I said, I kept coming up with ideas. But I want to just show you some of the different things so that you can kind of get your imagination going um, and start pulling materials together uh, so that you can use them in making your buttons. So when I first started, my idea was to just use, um, like, scraps, just junk and not anything new. And so I kind of went towards um, getting some of my, pulling out my box of just um, scraps of, of scrapbook paper. So that's what these, these started with. And um, they are, they're just stuff out of the box. And I altered them a little bit with color and I'll show you how I did that. Um, when, you, when I made these, I decided originally that I wanted to make shank style buttons because that's what I like in my neck warmers. Um, that way, if they're really artistic on the top, you're not gonna have holes there. They'll, and it's just, I like, I prefer the way that I sew them on and all that kind of thing to use shank style buttons. So I've made most of mine in this way, but I also did some, these were with scrap paper too, and I, I did these with two holes, and then I did some with four holes. These are actually um, made with scrim, and that is a fabric, I can find my scrap here, that is kind of just like a gauzy fabric, and I just have a whole bunch of this, so um, I just use that. And then you can alter the color of this. So um, I ended up with this color because I used um, uh, my antique photo uh, distress oxide around the edges, 
And then when I put the Mod Podge, it was able to blend it all together. And I'll demonstrate how this works because um, it's, to me, my favorite, easiest way to alter color um, and get the richness that I wanted. So that was Scrim. And then the next ones I kind of did was I had everything. I started looking at everything as circles. Um, these are little two, these are also scrap papers why I pulled these, but they're just little two hole buttons. These are half inch, these are inch. And I'll use these more for the junk journaling and that kind of thing, this size. Um, but like I said, the one inch is probably going to be what I use the most. So all of these um, were from the same bit of uh, decoupage paper. And this is the roll I used. And you can see when you roll it, there's just so many circles on this in design that there are going to be so many different um, buttons that I could come up with. So I have some from that roll that are not finished, but I want to show you just all the different ones that came. All of these came off of that same roll of paper in addition to these. So uh, you're going to just start looking at paper in a completely different way, I think. Um, and these, you know, the flower was a circular, but I kind of liked how I did it offset. So um, you're just going to kind of have to let your imagination go. And then I decided um, I wanted to try to do some that I could match to my neck warmer. So that that first batch that I did, I had done some of these. And I had this neck warmer that was kind of a unique colors and not easy to find buttons. Um, metal ones to me weren't enough. And to try to match a color wasn't going to work. So I, I chose this one and um, I added a little sparkle to it. I'll show you how I did that. Um, but I, I just love how you can really customize the buttons to fit the neck warmer. And so that kind of gave me the idea um, to start kind of pulling out neck warmers that I didn't have buttons that I loved um, and see if I could make some just custom. So I had this one and I just love these. And then it's hard to decide which ones you like better. But for these, these were also with scrapbook paper. And they were with one of my favorite um, Tim Holtz abandoned books. I'll put the link to this because this one, if you're going to do buttons, has just some beautiful color and pattern um, so that, you know, they won't be identical to each other, but they'll be similar. And I just think they're going to, I think these will be great. So I'll put the link to that too. Um, that, those actually came out of this actual piece of paper and uh, you can see that you'll just kind of find I'm going to use this punch when I make these and you'll kind of just use that circle to see what color they're going to be um, it just it's just kind of a lens so um, that's how I kind of you know decided about which papers and that kind of thing so that was these two and the other thing you'll notice about these, even though they came off the same piece of paper, their colors are a little bit different. These are a little lighter and these are a little darker. If you watched the first video I did about how to use the ice resin, you can either seal the paper or not seal the paper. And if you seal the paper, um, there's a product, the paper sealer, that's ice resin paper sealer you can use, or you can use Mod Podge. And for these, I used Mod Podge. So this is the same exact paper these are just a little darker and bluer because i didn't seal i didn't use paper sealer on these because i wanted to show you that contrast so that is one thing you can do to change the color if you have something you just want it to be a little darker then you can just not seal it these were all paper paper this was a wrapping paper that was actually just a scrap of gift wrap paper from a gift that i received and i just saved it because i loved it and i just liked how that little swirl um, part of the flower with the little polka dots in the middle. So that's that one. And then I wanted to just play around with inking them to see how they would come out. And so I used the same exact inks for both of these. This one was on um, craft paper color, and this one was on a cream cardstock color. Which, let's see if I have a piece of that somewhere. I thought I saved one. So that, that one was on that color. So that was the only difference. 
Um, so when you do your final top, if you're just going to go for a solid color or a modeled color like this, it's just going to depend on what color you had underneath. So that is that one. And then this one is actually a piece of uh, scrapbook paper. You can buy um, scrapbook paper just in singles. And sometimes there you can find um, different textures of paper. And that's what this one is. It's just kind of a metallic already. And it's just kind of a wrinkled looking paper. So I thought the texture, and I love the color, would, um, would be nice. So I also, uh, when I did that one, I did some that were plain. And I played around with the color by using my inks. So I did these two. They're not quite finished. I think I want one more coat. Um, these two were just done with the antique uh, vintage photo distress oxide. And I'll show you how to do that. But that was all I used on that one. And then this one, I actually did kind of, uh, I think it was called Rusty Hinge. It's kind of an orange color that I did over the top first and then did my vintage photo. So I was just playing around with different ways to alter the colors. And then this is with the vintage photo, but then I painted in the center. And if you've seen other videos where I've used that, um, it's kind of an opal -y paint, I forget what it's called, but it's two colors depending on what you paint it over. I'll, I'll put it in the description, but off the top of my head, I can't think of the name of it. I used that paint because I knew it had some iridescence to it and then just a gold pen. So you can, you know, if you're artistic, you can do anything and then cover it up. You could do photos. I haven't done that yet, but you know, you can do these with photos. Um, I also did some with, those. with cork. You can buy cork in, I don't have a scrap left because I've used it all. Uh, but it, the, in the scrapbook section, I had found sheets of cork that are paper thin, but it's real cork. So that's what I used for these. And then again, just did my vintage photo around the edges to finish off. And I'll show you how I do that. I think that's an important step just to kind of keep it from looking plain. And then I did some with burlap. And that's just a scrap of... I have lots of scraps of burlap because I used to do a lot of upholstery um, and pillow covers and that kind of thing with burlap. So it's just a little scrap of burlap. And there's a, a special way to handle that one. So I will, I'll show that in a demo, um, but that's the burlap. And then this is a paper that is, looks like fake bark. And I just love this paper. And it, it's gonna, for ones that you want to look really natural, um, it, this kind of has a texture to it already, and it kind of looks like a photo of bark. But I like a little bit darker color, so I used my vintage photo and adjusted the color of that, and I'll show you how I did that. That's that one. I'm making a bunch of those because I really like those. And then I did some also with... Um, I had recently pressed some leaves, um, some fall colored leaves. So I have some in reds and then some in the golds. Um, so I, I just did that in a flower press. And then here's a little green one. And then um, did the mod leaves. You just Mod Podge it on there. So that's another one. So that was kind of my first batches that I started. And then I went from there and went even a little nuts. And let's see. There's those ones that I just love. Here's my tray I'm working on now. Just to show you a few of these. See, there's more of the, the fake wood paper ones. And you can do them in, in different colors. So I've used different colors of Distress ink Oxide. Um, this was the vintage photo. And then this, I think I did vintage photo and some walnut stain on to get it a little darker. So you could leave a light. These... These don't have any resin on them yet. These are just started. So that's kind of the first step. And then these have maybe one coat of resin on them. So you can see, um, you know, you could just leave them like that. But to me, the more layers, the more time you take, the more professional and authentic looking buttons you'll have. So I guess it depends on what you want to use it for too. These I did with um, Rusty Screen. And I did uh, the peacock feathers 
um, distress oxide underneath and then some um, the vintage photo I think too this one just has just the vintage photo but that was just um, from stuff flying everywhere here from just a piece of rusty door screen that I saved yes I saved that I love anything rusty and so I I have I hoard little bits of that because it's not always easy to find that kind of old stuff and I just hang on to it because I I never know when I might want it for texture. And then this one, I use, this is just a window screen too, old window screen, but it's not rusty. And so I did some, these are just, have one coat on them too, with just the vintage photo. And then I think I did some, have tried some with some color on, on this also somewhere. This one I did with, it's just got peacock feather distress oxide and then the, which I'll probably add another color to that. I'll leave that aside so we can play with that together. And then I did some with, um, all of these here are with uh, Tim Holtz vintage wallpaper pack. And then I used the distressing oxide on that too. So it's this paper pack, I'll put that in the link. But when you look at it, you just kind of, you know, look at ones that I could see doing one that's a circle there. Um, you know, that would be a nice one. So I kind of just, you can see where I've just taken a little centered section. And that's the nice thing about the circle punch is it's just your frame. You can see exactly what your button's going to look like. So that was with that. I mean, there are so many papers, book pages, vintage um so many different, you know, paper packs out in the world that there are, um, you just, you know, you're just going to have so many different options for buttons. I mean, they're endless. So this one, this one I did, I did this one first and it's not finished either, but that was just a piece of eyelet fabric. I want to do some with lace, but I haven't done that yet. But this, I saw that and I thought, oh, that looks about the right size circle. So I aged this with, um, some of my gathered twig dispress oxide spray. So if you've done, haven't done this before, you just spritz it with water, get it wet, and then one spritz of this, and then just kind of mess it up in there. And you can dilute it if you need to, or whatever. Keep till you get the color you want, and then just I dry it with my heat gun, and and there you have it. So I did this one with the peacock feather underneath, just the the ink, and then I put. Um, my little eyelet fabric on there and then I used my vintage photo to get that dark around the edge so that was that one and then I decided to fussy cut those little flowers out and I really like how those turned out so again just the vintage photo at the, around the edge afterwards so I'll, I'll show you how I did all that and these also have a little sparkle which I'll, I'll show you how I add a little sparkle to that too these I'm gonna do um, I think as necklaces so I made them a little thinner, and I'll show you that. And these are going to have multiple layers um, in a mixed media style when they're finished. But I think I'm going to make these independents. So, you know, they could be buttons. They could be other things. Um, you know, you just start with something round. So this was that other color um, from the Tim Holtz paper that I really liked. And I'm thinking, one of these I was thinking, this is another neck warmer. I was kind of trying to find find buttons for so see how you can just kind of customize it but then you know you get so many it's like okay now I don't know which one which one I might like better you know there's so many choices here this one is turning out to be my newest favorite I think that I haven't finished but this one you're gonna laugh can you see that up close do you see how it has a little texture in there Okay, that was made from my little bag of potatoes. I know, you're going to start looking at every single thing. I, I look in the garbage and I'm like, oh, wait, that got thrown away. No, that would be a nice texture. I love the color of that. Um, so, yeah, I'll save these. So, now you kind of, 
see the kinds of materials there's really no limit i mean it needs to be flat enough to be able to put on a button is about is about it um but think color texture um different materials just a way to use up all your scraps so here's how we're going to get started now the first thing that i need to do is have a place that i'm going to put these to cure um if you've watched the first video of ice resin or worked with it, you know that you can only do one pour and then it has to sit eight to 12 hours to cure before you can work on it again. So you need a nice flat surface um, and something where it won't stick. So I use these studio sheets from Ranger. Um, this, these are the nine by nine, it comes two per pack, or I have a 15 by 18 and you can cut those in half and fit them on a tray. That's what I use for my tabletop, and I'll I'll put one here so I don't make a mess. Um, but you want something in a cookie sheet works nice, so you need something that you can carry it and get it put out of your way. So we have that, and then I'm gonna put a studio sheet on my workspace here so that I don't mess up my table. And then you're gonna use a circle punch. Now I have a half inch one and I have a one inch one. Um, this is the one inch, I use this the most. It comes with this little thing on it here to catch your little circles. I take that off because I wanna really see very clearly what I'm punching out. So you need that. And then you need scraps of anything. Doesn't matter, that's when I had those boxes. After doing um, several batches of these, I have found what I like to work with. You'll use less layers if you use a thicker uh, material. So these work out nice. There was one box of crackers or something I had that was too thick for my punch. So you'll get used to what you feel comfortable punching with your punch. Um, and But you can use plain cardstock. You can use all those ugly papers that you don't know what to do with, but you don't want to throw them out. If you're gonna use regular thin, thin paper, I would maybe glue a couple sheets, two or three together, so that it's like the weight of cardstock. That way you only have to punch once and at least they're already glued together. It'll just be faster, I think. So um, I would do that. This is just regular cardstock and it's scraps that I was making my button things and didn't like them. So I could just use that. So any little, any little scrap of anything you know, just punch it out. So you can sit and watch TV and punch out a bazillion of these, and then you'll have them all ready to go. So I do have some that I, some things I've started in different phases, and I have a little bit of Mod Podge. I think I'll need a little bit more here. You'll want a paintbrush to put your Mod Podge on with. And I put my Mod Podge, if you've seen me do a video before, I, I buy, I usually use matte. Now, if you don't want to use the resin and you just want to make some buttons that look a little rustic, you can use gloss Mod Podge. I just think they're not going to look like a professional button. They're going to look like a handcrafted button. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're using them for your junk journals and that kind of thing. But I wanted to be able to make real authentic looking professional buttons for my neck warmer. So I needed to use the ice resin. So I I use the big wide mouth um, things of Mod Podge because it's the glue I use the most. And then I just have this little th throwaway thing and you can see it's getting thick um, because that way when I'm finished, I can scrape all this back into my jar and then the little bits dry and then this will be full someday and I'll toss it. But in the meantime, it works great. So I have some of these already made up um, and you can do them dif different thicknesses depending on uh, how thick you want your button to be. Let me see if I have some just paper here that I started. No, nope. let's see. I want some thicker ones. There we go. So these are my circles I've cut out of uh, different cardboard things. I think I've glued them all together already. Okay, so let's just pretend. So we'll take one and I'm just gonna cover it, it really nicely with that and I'll put one on top. So again, if you're making buttons, um, make them in batches so that you know how many pieces so that they're all the same. 
So I like to, you know, I make my my buttons in either threes or twos. So if you make a dozen, then you have, you know, several. So we're just going to pretend like I did more layers on this. So the most important thing is to make sure that um, all your edges are covered and that they're, ev they're even. You don't want them sliding off of each other. And what will happen, <coughs> sorry, is... If you use that, like that Avery, Avery packaging, this one, these are real slick. So if you tried to do this on the same side, they're going to really want to slide against each other. So I try to at least have a slick one against a matte one. It just makes it easier. Now, one thing I wanted to do and mention, and I didn't, was I put gloves on mostly because if you get Mod Podge on the top, or on the edges, like you can't see it, but there's some Mod Podge that didn't get cleaned off of this one. That's gonna act like a resist to any ink or anything that you put on that. Which if you want them to look vintage, that's fine. But if you're wanting them to look perfect, it, they won't. So you need to be aware that you have to clean it, your hands in between. And it's much easier to clean the glue in ink off of a glove than it is off of your hand. So otherwise, I don't mind if my hands get messy. Um, so what I do is I keep a baby wipe that's wet baby wipe. That way, in between each one, I can clean my fingers, clean the glue off of the glove. And then I'm at least my chances of being neater are better. So that would be um, to make a bunch of these is your first step, okay? And then you're going to just decide what you want on the top. Now, these I've already done. I've put some cork on this one and this one. That one I've started. This one I've started putting color on already. I just wanted to get a few out here that I've started. These are some different ones. I don't want that one. Okay, so let's take, where did my little paper go? We're going to take one and I'm going to put my little vintage, to look like a little vintage plate. So Mod Podge, get that centered. Clean my fingers. And then just use your fingers to squeeze all the glue out. And then you can just go around the edge. Having the glue just on that edge is okay because um, that's gonna actually help uh, not be able to see the ridges. They're gonna just look more like one unit there. So get that there and clean my fingers. Now, just for fun, I'll do one with to show you that you can you can cut some things with this and some things won't cut. So I'm gonna just look for a nice spot. Over here's better. Put that in there. And it went flying. But there I have my little screen. Now this other screen door this did not cut, it was too thick. It wouldn't cut with this. So what I would do in that case, I'm gonna take another one here. I'll do this one. And I'm just gonna, maybe cut this off. Put lots of Mod Podge on this one. Now, when you have a screen door or the burlap, same thing, those are gonna create little voids in between all those little squares. And that's gonna be a ripe place for bubbles from your resin. So what I like to do is squish that down really, really good. Maybe put something weighted on top of it. Until it dries, I need something with weight. Oops. And you want to do maybe even um, more layers of 
Mod Podge in there so that it's thicker. And then let that dry. Okay, that made a big old mess. I'm just going to hold this for just a second before I let go. I didn't, I didn't plan for something heavy to put on it. Let's see. Oh, I know. I'll put it over here. We'll use my steel block. That'll be good. But just for a minute, I don't want it to glue to the bottom of it. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. Okay, so that's that one. And then maybe a little burlap piece on one so we can see how the colors work. Now, if you want, you can also color this before you put your burlap, and then that way you would see a color underneath. So let's do that just for fun. So I'm gonna take my peacock feathers, and I'm gonna go around the edges. And do the top side. And if you want it to have a model look, you don't even have to do it very perfectly. Let that dry for a second. And you want to also be aware to clean ink off of your fingers because if you're working with different ones and you're trying to make them all look the same, your ink will transfer to from one to the other thing. So you don't want to do that. So that's that one. Let's see if this is stuck enough that I don't have to glue it to my steel block. Okay, we'll put that aside. Now, you'll want, I'll want to do another layer of glue on this just to get it stuck down really well. That's going to take a while, though, so we'll wait. Okay, and then my, my burlap one. Now, if I put the Mod Podge on here before I let that dry really well, it's just going to come off, so I'm going to set that. that ink a little bit and I will put the Mod Podge on now see what it did to my brush I need to clean that or it's going to be on my next thing okay and I have to let that one dry too because I have to cut that off so you can, anything you can punch with a punch obviously is easier, but if you can't, then you can always um, cut it out later. And I will try to show one if one dries fast enough. Oops. So let's do one of these because I want to add sparkle and show you how I do that. So that is just one of those little flower circles I cut out. Easy, easy. And then clean off any excess glue. Okay, there's that one. Okay, I think that's probably good for now. rid of that. Now I think before I go too much further I want to mix up some resin if I want to show you that part because it needs to sit for a minute. So let's see. Make sure that doesn't stick to the bottom. And that's drying. So if you didn't watch the first video um, the resin is a two-part uh, epoxy and I like to make they're equal parts that you mix, and because this is a clear cup, once I start pouring resin in there, you're not going to be able to see the line. So I just use a Sharpie marker and make lines where I want. They recommend you mix an ounce at a time, but that to me is a lot of waste. I've never had a problem with mixing less. This case, I'm mixing probably the minimal amount that I would do, but it's because I'm I'm just doing this for a demo. So I'm going to take my part A is um, the resin. 
and I am going to get my head down here where I can see. Now the resin, the part A is a little thicker than the part B. So this is a new bottom one. I didn't make my hole quite big enough, it looks like. So it's thicker, and so I stop squeezing my bottle before it gets to the line because it's going to settle out and it may reach the line and you might go over. So um, I'm going to stop here for a second and you could just use your baby wipe to clean, clean that off. I need to make my hole a little bit bigger. And then the part B is thinner. So that one comes out pretty quick. So you want to be aware of that. I need just a little bit more. So it was better than I make my hole a little bit bigger in my bottle. Now, like I've said before, I buy these really big bottles. These are like eight ounces each. This lasts a long time, even for me, and I do this all the time. So you can buy smaller bottles of this. And if you're not sure if this is something that you're gonna do a lot, I would just get the small bottles to start. You're supposed to use it up within six months um, or the hardener, which is part B, will kind of turn an amber color. Um, not the end of the world, it'll still work. I use that for um, a colored, you know, you can add color to this. But I actually just finished up my bottle and when I got my new bottle, the color wasn't that much off. So what'll happen is it's kind of a yellow, it'll get a little darker. Um, I store this in a closet, so you want to keep it out of direct sunlight, and then you're fine. Okay, so I have my two parts, and then you're supposed to mix this for a solid two minutes. Um, I'm not going to really do that because we'll be here forever. But I'm just going to, you want to fold it and just make sure that the color is totally mixed together. And then you're supposed to let it sit for five minutes, um, I think mostly to let some of the bubbles dissipate. Um, because that's your enemy and they'll kind of settle out you know on their own but you have to keep an eye on them and pop any as you go otherwise you have to fix them later which you can this is self-healing and self-doming and self-leveling and all that good stuff so just make sure you get that mix nice okay so we're gonna let that just sit to the side here throw this away and then a lot of people, you know, in the books and stuff I've read, she recommends, you know, use that popsicle stick to do your pores. I like to use a little throwaway paintbrush. Um, it seems like a lot, most of the stuff that I use is pretty thin layers and precision, so I like to use that. Okay, so some coloring things we can do here. So um, one thing here is these cork ones, and I've started these. Um, let me take one that I haven't started. Now, I can seal this with Mod Podge if I want. They're all white, so they'll take the color a little different. You can see that these are kind of like a verdigris color, which I love. So to get that, what I did, and you're gonna, you know, get all the colors you have and do all the experiments and practicing you want, but um, to do this one, I actually am not gonna do the edges yet. I think I wanna leave those brown. So, but I'm gonna do just this top. And I don't even need to do it everywhere. I can just leave some of that showing through like that. Now I wanna do all three of these at the same time because the goal would be that they look like they go together. So if you, I have done batches or I'm telling you, I'll think I'm gonna remember the recipe and I'll go to do one the next day and I'm like, okay, what exactly is it that I did? I won't remember. So that could be age or whatever, but, um, I'm really bad about taking notes and writing things down. So I'm just gonna plan to do them and do a whole batch. Okay, so that's that one. And then I'm gonna take, clean your fingers off. It's just, you get into a habit of doing this and it's like second nature. You don't even think about it anymore. Then I wanna take my, um, the vintage photo Distress Oxide, and I can sit there and heat gun that or not. I'm going to want it kind of blended anyway, so I'm just going to do this. Actually, since I started this one, I think while I have this one done, I'm going to add that little screen that I cut out first. 
Make sure my brush didn't get dirty. So I'm just going to add that to that one. That's going to take a lot more Mod Podge, but I want it to kind of start to stick there first. So I'll set that aside. Okay, now I want to get the edges of these to be this vintage photo. And I think it's important as far as I'm, you don't want to leave it like that. Then it just looks like a handcrafted thing. So I want it to look like it was made out of wood or something like that. Okay, I'm not going to do all these now, so you don't have to watch me do each one. So I got that around the edges, and then I want to go around these edges. Just like you do your paper, if you do paper crafting, just like you do ink the edges. I just think that it makes it look that one more step done. Now I could go more in there if I want or not, because I'm going to show you the next step. So you went from this to this, which I think looks a lot better, but then even another better step is you take your Mod Podge and two things it's gonna do, I, it's gonna help seal, if I want this edge to look um, all like one piece of something and not layers of paper, if I fill in with this Mod Podge it goes in those cracks kind of before I do my resin. It's just going to make one less resin step I need around the edge, I think. So then I'm just going to go and you're going to watch how magically this blends. And it fills in those cracks of that cork. I see my brush. I need to clean that. But it, it fills in. It. I'll hold that there. You'll see it kind of happening. Um, it will just kind of blend those colors together in a really, really pretty way, I think. So I'm going to sit that aside and let that. And that's probably what I did to these, but I need more brown. I'm not thrilled with how they look, so I'm going to doctor these up later myself. See if I can get something else going. Now this was that um, that faux bois I call it that uh, birch uh, bark looking paper, and so that one I also did. I did some with just the distress oxide one, but then I didn't like. I wanted it even kind of that grayer color, so I added some of the walnut stain. So this is the. And when you do this, you'll see I have some, you see different colors in there from the layers of paper. This is just going to help kind of take all that away and blend it in better. And then I like to do the back side too while I'm at it, because even though it's the back of a button, say I decide I want to sell these, I want them to look nice. So same thing, I'm going to kind of go around the edge a little bit like that. Now I could just leave it like that, but I want to show you the different effects of using this Mod Podge as like a blender. Let's clean my brush and I'm going to go and just kind of let that blend in. So it makes it a little bit darker, but more just like off white. So I could leave it like that or I could do an add after that dries a minute add in the walnut stain and let's see let's do let's do this one I did this one with walnut stain I like how it comes out so this is um, the distress ink and walnut stain is the color and I'm going to do the same thing let me get the back first oops that must mean my glove is not clean And then we'll do these edges. Now, if you don't know the difference between Distress Ink and Distress Oxide, Tim Holtz has a really good video 
where he goes through and explains that difference and how the colors, you can have a color of distressed oxide and the same exact named color in distress ink and they're not the same. So if you have ever been curious about that, uh, oxide has pigment in it that ink doesn't have the same. So I would recommend his video and you can just search it in YouTube and you'll find it there. But if I find a link, I'll, I'll put it on there, but it's really a good video. So I've just done around the edges and you can kind of see little bits where it's not covered. It's because that is where my uh, Mod Podge might be. And so it kind of acted as a resist. I don't mind it on this at all because it's just gonna kind of give me that vintage plate look. So then the next step to really get that um, looking like the plate, vintage plate, is to do the Mod Podge around again. And it it's like acts like a blender and a, it's like magic. I mean, I don't know if it's gonna show up on camera like this, but when you're sitting there doing this, it instantly starts to, to just like look ethereal or something. It just blends it and it just, to me, it's that one more step to make it like look professional. It just looks like you gla like a glazed porcelain plate. I just love that. So that's my little vintage plate one. I had already done this one. So it's already got the Mod Podge that blended it. But I just love that. Okay, so that was another little trick. Let's see where we are here. Let me clean my brush again. And Oops, I think I'm ready for a new baby wipe here. So I'm making a mess. To me, that's kind of, it's not that I'm just a neat freak, because trust me, I'm not. It's just for this project, you really don't want to transfer all the bad stuff onto your good project. So it's just to me kind of an important thing. So the next thing I want to show you while that is still drying a little bit is I'll do the sparkle one. So if you want to add sparkle, um, I'm not a huge sparkly person, but for certain things like this cute little pink flower, I just think it does add something. And I did it on the potato. Did I even show you that? I think I did. The little potato bag ones, those have sparkle. And... I'm pretty sure I showed you, but just in case. Oops. Not the, the light will catch it. See that little bit of shimmer in there? That I did with um, this sheer shimmer um, craft spray. And it just has a really fine shimmer to it. So it's not like spray glitter kind of, I guess. But I just give that a couple of, make sure it's not around everything else. A couple of spritz. Now I did this. Um, I did not seal this paper, and I should have. So I'm gonna try doing it after. Actually, I think I did need to do this first. I can't remember the order that I did it before. Um, and this one does help if you put a heat gun on it because it takes a little bit to dry. So Now, this paper was really thin, wrapping paper, and so it is important to seal it because otherwise, when I resin that, it's going to look like water stains on that. So I want to make sure I get that good. But um, first, before I think I even do that, I'm going to do some distressing around the edge because I still, I want that edge to look finished. So I think my glitter stuff's dry enough. And I'm going to go around the edges and get the back so it doesn't look like cardboard, the old cardboard box. I mean, if you can do a project like this and no one will know what you use, then you, you won. You did a good job. So my goal is that nobody would pick this up and think I made it out of garbage. So I did a little bit of my, now this paper is more slippery. It's slicker than like a 
regular like copy paper or something. So you'll notice when you put the this ink on it it looks slippery or I don't know how to describe it I guess is um it just looks different. So you can actually, I don't know if you can see that that has just a little bit of sparkle, not a ton. Let me see if I can catch it in the light. I don't know if I can. Trust me, it's there. It is. Okay. So I can use the Mod Podge on it. And it's just going to kind of seal all that in there. And it's going to, to me, I'm not a huge pink person either. And to me, doing that, it just kind of um, gives it a little bit of a vintage look, which I kind of like. I'm not a huge bright color person. So that's just me. And I'm going to clean my brush again and clean my fingers again. So I don't think I'm going to go and do more color and play with these too much more because I think you get the idea. And that's enough. So this one, just to show you, um, we're ready to cut this apart it's it's uh, dry enough so you can use your little fussy cut scissors or I like because they're curved these little cuticle scissors uh, because I'm going around a circle it's just a, a nice easy way to get a nice tight cut around my circle so even though not everything can be cut out with that circle punch stuff like this uh, when you do it with scissors, you could it, you could make it look, you know, pretty perfect, I think. So it, in the event that you're doing something, and I have done something um, that I did with uh, paper, and I had to, I can't remember why I did it, or I don't know, eh, maybe it was the fabric, um, the scrim or something. One of the ones I did, um, I couldn't get it cut around to look perfect, and I don't, really going to work it on this one but you can use a file or even just an emery board and kind of go around the edge which that's actually going to make kind of a neat effect i like happy accidents you never know when you're going to discover something but i was doing something and i didn't like how the edge looked so in order to make it look more professional finished I just went around it with this and it I loved how it looked actually. So I almost think it was that screw and it might have been. Um, okay, so that one and then what other one did I want to show you? I have this one. This one I needed to cut because um, it wouldn't go through my punch. It was a little too thick. This was the rusty screen. For that one I used my, these are for my jewelry kit and they're metal shears. And that way you don't ruin your regular scissors. So. Um, unless you just want to dedicate a pair of scissors to be your metal scissors. I don't know how long they'll last, but these, these cut metal sheet metal and stuff from my, my jewelry kit, but, um, they go right through this, even though they're not curved, they work fine. And then you just cut that. So then I would do the same thing. Make sure I get the edges with my distressing or whatever. I'm just not going to worry about that right now. I'm going to clean all this rust off because that's going to totally destroy my resin. So I think if you have any questions about like techniques or anything that you saw on one, um, you can ask me in the comments. I, but I think for now, this will give us enough to, to play with at least getting a layer of, we'll do that one, a layer of resin on there. No, just for heck. So I need my tray. I'll just take this. I need my tray. My resin's good. I have my brush. So the next thing that you're going to do is, um, some of these have one coat on them already. Maybe I'll do, uh, I don't want to do that one. Um, if you do the kind with screen or the burlap, anything with little holes, gaps, same with these, you want to do a pretty thin layer, uh, first layer because you 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 don't want to have bubbles and the thicker you try to put it on the first time you might get bubbles so that's just it's going to take one more step the other all these <clears throat> excuse me just have one coat so far so basically all you're going to do is um, for this one to clean up your mess the baby wipe is not as good as um, rubbing alcohol 
So I just keep a cheap thing of alcohol and a paper towel. And this is a really important part because you really, especially when you're on second, third, last coat especially, you want to um, keep your fingers clean so that you don't um, damage something that's already finished and good. So I'm just gonna take one of these and my little brush. I don't wanna do it over these because if I drip, I'm gonna be sad. So I'm just gonna go around the edge first. And usually the edges, I would say two coats, um, you know, so in the edges might be good. If you do three, and you know, I usually do like one side and the edge until the edges are good and then I stop there. I don't want to get them too, too bulked up. But, you know, you go by feel. So if I want this to be really nice and smooth, I'll go by feel. Now, I did that first. You're going to say, well, why? Now you're going to get your fingers on it. That's okay, because I'm going to do another coat at some point. And actually, I could go like this, and I'm smooth. You know, it's fine. But again, I want to dry, my, clean my fingers on that alcohol. And then I'm just going to take this and just do a thin layer over the whole thing. And that's it. Just a thin layer. And then I'm just going to take a good look at it for bubbles. Make sure in the light. And then I'm just going to set it on my tray. So I put it right there. Don't touch it anymore. You might check it by the time you've done a whole tray. Um, just FYI, the amount that I mixed um, quantity-wise, if you're doing this, I did... Um, and under fluid ounces on this little medical measuring cup, I did the one eighth and one quarter. Um, and then that amount, the reason I'm telling you is if you're making necklaces or something or filling a mold or something like that, I can see why you'd pour, you'd mix an ounce because you're pouring it thicker. You can only work with this for a half an hour before it sets up or it starts getting too thick to work. So if you mix too much, you're not even gonna get this whole sheet done because you saw how long it takes to do each one, right? So I mix up a smaller amount and that amount will fill up about half a tray. So if I wanted to keep going, I need to mix up another batch, but that's about the length of time, working time that it takes me to do it. So I just thought I'd throw that out there so that you don't, you kind of know how much mix in here I said I wasn't going to do this over these so I don't ruin the other ones so this one has um just a coat of Mod Podge on it but no resin yet so I'm going to go ahead and do this and doing an, you know the other Mod Podge underneath it kind of just helps fill in those gaps where your bubbles might get trapped so it's okay to do you can do several coats of Mod Podge if you want um because you're better off it's probably cheaper to use a Mod Podge. Um, you, If you have brush lines and all that, they kind of disappear in the resin because it's self-healing. So it kind of fills in any little gaps um, as you go. So anytime, you, like if you make a mistake or anything like that, that's okay because it's gonna you can fix it. In fact, I have a couple of ones that ha ended up with some big globs on them that I need to sand off. And then I can go back and um, fix those. And just do do more resin. So I'm I'm not going to do any more of these. I want to show you oops, how to finish them off. Then so for mine, um, I'll kind of show you on one that's not finished. Uh, you just have to decide how domed do you want the to the button to be. Um, the more rounded, you know, that's a certain look. A more modern looking button, maybe maybe you made your um, your base thicker and then you left your edges sharper and that might make it look like a more contemporary design so that's just kind of something to think about um, let me see if I can find one here that is now these these are close for some people they might say well that's just good enough for me I'm ready to flip it over and do the back side I kind of go by feel. I could be done with this one. There's a little rougher edge here. 
I could do it that I could get rid of that by doing another coat on the top or I can be done whatever you decide okay once you've gotten the top uh say this is three coats I think it probably is so that means that took me three days I made the base and did the decorative part and I did a coat had to wait till the next day to do the second coat, next day, third coat, okay? Now I'm ready to flip it over and do the backside. Here's something I learned from experience. Resin is dry in eight to 12 hours, but it's not cured until three or four days, depending on your temperature. And you can tell that by if you touch it and you, you can feel if you could press it and your fingerprint will sit there. If that happens, you can rub that out usually but if you don't feel like you can stick your fingernail in it or, you know, really push on it without leaving a mark, then it's not cured yet. And even just its own weight, when I put that upside down, sitting on this craft sheet, which has a little bit of a weave to it, if I don't have this completely cured, like if I just tried to do the bottom the next day, when I flip it over, I'm going to see that weave pattern in my resin. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. So I actually had that happen to a couple of mine because I didn't wait. And so when I tell you this bottom half, you're gonna say, oh, that would really mess it up. So I have been, I have a tray, and that's what these are. Um, and you could even maybe put a sticky note and write the date you put them in here or something. These are ones that the tops are finished, but I'm letting them cure for a few days before I flip them over and do the backside because I, I don't want to have to go back and fix them. Now, if you do have to go back and fix them, um, what I did was I took my, I have this little um, packing pad. You could use a piece of foam, a styrofoam or something that was in a box. This came out of a bo uh, my butcher box thing. I use it to make my book binding pokey thing. I covered one side with packing tape so it's slick. And then I made holes so that if I need to, there's a button that's done. If I need to fix the top, like actually this one is one that I want to fix. So it had a big glob on it where I had put poured too much. I want to sand all that off and redo that bottom. And then I want to do the top last. There's like a little bump here that I can see. So I can sand that and smooth it all out be done and then I can just put it here and do my one less coat on the top so it won't stick and it's just so I try to make it be where my last thing is putting that shank on the back but if I mess something up you do something like this and you can go back and fix the top again because remember it needs to sit flat so these were a couple where'd that other one go these were a couple that I that I did and then I need to go back and fix something on. This one has a little bit too much on the edge, so I need to sand that off too. Um, but basically you can see what they look like with a shank on them then. And I'll show you how I did, how I made those. Um, I think I, let me use gloves now. So I just made up a whole bunch ahead of time, but I'm gonna do one so I can show you. If I have a little bit of wire now I you can use jewelry wire if you have if you make jewelry um, I have this little bag of jewelry that I this is all jewelry wire but it's not the stuff that I use for my jewelry um, so I I don't want to toss it because it's useful for certain things right so I'm just gonna take I thought I had another one out already This is just kind of um, copper wire that's coated. Um, this is the kind of wire you can buy packages of these like with multiple colors. I don't even know what gauge it is, but I, you can see you can find these at Michael's. This is what I used um, just to make it easy. And then you can use like um, a skewer or something like that. I found it easier because I have these to use my. These are bail making pliers, so there's six different sizes, and they're they're straight, so you can wrap multiple times, and all your circles are the same size. So I'm using this one here, and what I decided to do is if I I want it has to stand up by itself in resin and not fall over. So I decided I needed to make it 
two wraps on the top so that it could be three on the bottom, if that makes sense. So if you can see that, I wrapped it so this is the top, it's two, but on the bottom I came back around so it's three. So it's kind of like a spring um, and this worked fine. So I did that and then just cut that off. And that way that little thing will sit flat and it won't fall over. So that's what I used to make my shank. Now there may be somebody has a better idea than that, but um, I tried that and it works. And so I made a whole bunch of them. So what I would do here then is, let's see one that I think is ready to flip over. I think I did these already. Let me see, give me one second. Okay, I'm gonna take this one that's a cork one. It's all done and nice, okay? But I don't have anything on this back side. So I need to put my gloves on again, sorry. And gloves are not as easy to put on when you've had them on and taken them off. But. but I'm gonna get this all over my hands if I don't. Now, like I said, alcohol will take it off, but I don't usually ever do resin without gloves. Even though the woman that invented it, I watched one of her videos and she does, but she's much neater than I am, I guess. So I'm just gonna take that in my hand, be very careful and do my last layer on the back. I don't want this to go over the edge because then it's gonna be on the top and I'm gonna to have to fix that. So you don't need a lot on, this is the back of it anyway, right? If your back is a mess because there's glue and different things or, you know, where resin from doing the other sides or the, you know, edges got on the back and you want it to be more smooth, I would do one coat and then do another coat the next day. So, I think that looks okay. So I'm gonna set it on my my finished tray here. Clean my fingers, use my tweezers, pick up that little thing, oops. Okay, oh, it's on camera. And, and then put it in the, oops. Put it in the middle and you can just eyeball it. That looks good. Okay, so I don't want to touch that anymore. That is there for until tomorrow and then hopefully it will be finished. So I think, let's see, you might want to make holes. Let me put this away, it's still more safe. Now, if you want to make holes um, instead of doing the shank because you don't want you don't have those tools and you don't want to deal with the whole wire and all that, we don't need that anymore. Then you can um, make holes with several different things. So maybe you have a Dremel tool that has you can just do a, a drill bit. If you do jewelry, maybe you have um, the what do you call it the I've lost the name of it, but you know what I mean. If you have a drill, you have a tool, um, you can use that like a dental tool thing. And what am I looking for? And if you don't uh, have that, I use, my favorite thing to use is an actual um, drill press. And maybe your husband has one of those. If he works on cars or has a working wood shop or anything, even if it's a big, massive one, you can use that. I have a little small one. It's it's on my jewelry bench, so I can't bring it over here. But um, it's just a drill press. So it, it means it's a drill that is has like a little handle that will lower the bit up and down. So it goes straight up and down. That's all it does. But that's for precision, and that's what I use. So basically, you would take, let's pretend this is a finished button. And what I did was I just took an actual button that was close to the same size to decide where I wanted my holes. 
And then I used my little pokey tool or an awl or something. A pen won't usually fit through there, but something that will poke a dimple in it to mark where you want your holes. So I actually just took a couple of buttons. I had another one that was a little bit bigger that had the four holes for the thing, but I used it earlier today. Now I don't know what I did with it. But um, you can do that, or if you don't have any of that, I, I have this little drill that this is what I used to use before I had my drill press. So if you don't have a power, a Dremel tool, a power drill or anything like that, you can use these little hand ones. Now I got this at the gem show. Um, I, I buy all my, I'll look at Rio Grande maybe has it, but um, you can maybe look online um, just for a little hand drill. And it comes with different size, um, what do you call that? I forget what that's called too, but um, you, so that you can use different size bits in there. And I just pick one that's kind of the size. The neat thing about it is this spins independent of this. So it fits in the palm of your hand. And so you can kind of, you can turn that in the part in the palm of my hand is not turning, right? So it's kind of a way to hold it. So you can just manually drill your holes too. You don't need anything powerful. So this will take just a little bit longer, but you're drilling through resin and paper. It's really easy. It's not like drilling through wood. So that's how you can make holes in it. Um, I wanted to show you one more little idea that I had that I haven't, I haven't done any of these with resin yet, but I'm going to, is when I was trying to think of other things that I can use to do with, things to do with these buttons, is um, just push pins. So you can take, you know, and turn these, like I think for this size, this little ones, how cute would, the, would that be? So I would just do my layer of resin and put that on there because resin can be like the glue. And then you have just little decorative push pins. So there was that. Um, if you do junk journaling and that kind of thing, you've seen people do um, little uh, cute paper clips, right? You just doll up your paper clip. So to do that, I thought what I would do is you need, it needs to be flat. Like if I put that, then it's going to be at a weird angle. That actually might not be too bad, but to get it level, I would just use another one just as a bridge. So I would only put resin on this one. Okay. And then I can just have that be my holder. And then I could do another one. I'd put resin on this one and let that one be its bridge, you know, and then, so you'd have to do them in batches, but that's why I said these take these can take a week because just of all the drying time. So you can do that. You can use big paper clips for the big ones. You know, that was an idea. And then the other thing I thought would be neat, and I this is just the size that I have. I'm gonna see if I can find um larger ones, um, but little brads. You can use that on the small ones because I think I think those will stand up. Yeah, see in the resin, you can just stand that up and have little brads. I think bigger ones might be easier. And and actually for what I was thinking about using for, I kind of wanted this to be longer, um, just that I can get them through something thicker. I tried making brads on my own using my bezel wire. Um, and I, had an, I haven't perfected that, so I, I didn't want to show that today. If I ever get to that point, I will. But um, or come up with a better idea. But I just thought those were some different ideas to do with the buttons besides just a button you sew on, you know, like you'd think of. Um, the other thing that I did, and what I do with it, is I made some, oh, here we go. I made some that I didn't even put on the layers of paper. I just took a single layer. This was just some uh, ledger paper. I did some with book paper and I did some with graph paper. And then I just did a hole in the middle with the eyelet. You can either eyelet these right to your project, or if you don't do, you could use a brad later and put it, you know, put a brad through there onto your project. But I thought it was a cute idea to do like for an envelope closure, you know, or the kind where you use two and you do the string in between, you know, wrapping it around. So I did make some just like that too. So I think that's about it for today. Um, 
I, I hope that you enjoyed it and I hope it got your creativity going here. Um, like I said, if you come up with ideas, um, please put them in the comments. And if you have questions about, you know, specific ones that I did that you'd like to see how I did it, if I can remember, I, I'll be happy to share that. Um, and if I come up with um, some new ideas and new uh, materials and stuff that I, I do, I might do like a follow-up fun one of just some finished, you know, different buttons that I've made over time. So that obviously will take some time. But um, anyway, thanks for joining me. And um, like I said, give me a thumbs up if you like it. Follow me on my Facebook page and I'll put all the links and things like that in the description. So have a great rest of your day. Now go make something. Bye.